Welcome to the Therapist Uncut Podcast, where off-the-clock therapists who happen to be friends share their uncensored thoughts about real life. Join us weekly in spreading positivity and making mental health relatable through casual conversation, inspirational stories, and real talk with friends who happen to be therapists. Please welcome your co-hosts, Nikki Young, Jolene Daly, and Alyssa Nahara. Good morning. Welcome to another episode of Therapist Uncut. This morning, we're going to be talking about homeschooling and the fact that you are now all homeschooling parents. Everybody's favorite subject. (laughs) Everyone is excited and so proud to be homeschool parents. It is in California and we do call it distance learning because eventually, hopefully, we'll be able to get the kids back into the classrooms where it's probably the best for everybody. (laughs) So I wonder, though, if there are other people listening to us in different states, if they're actually in school right now. Yeah, let us know. We are based out of California, so we know how California is holding it down and trying to manage schools. But if you guys are out of state or even out of country, let us know how you what your guys' state is doing. I know that I heard in Mexico they were actually converting distance learning into or parts of Mexico on the TV. And so all of the age groups were getting the same curriculum at a different hour of the day just to avoid any of these internet barriers. So it was all being broadcasted through the TV, which I thought was really cool. That's interesting because the internet has been a barrier here, I know. Yeah. Yeah, let's talk about some of the barriers. I know there's been a lot, but let's talk about some of the barriers that nobody could have anticipated would even be a barrier to distance learning. Like the fact that not everybody has internet. That That's a huge barrier, especially if you live in the country. I think that's a big one because, and I know the school districts, at least our local school districts have made sure that kids have access to internet in one way or another, whatever that looks like. But even, I mean, we live in a well-populated area of Modesto, California, and we're supposed to have the highest bandwidth, speed, whatever, the, the best internet in the area. And it it's terrible. And it's been terrible for a couple months. So I think, you know, the systems were not built to handle everybody being home on their devices streaming and and all of these things so yeah not at all this is like a huge surprise for so many different people and communities and the rural communities that I work with a lot of families are driving to the school because they don't have access to internet in their rural areas so they have to drive to the school sit in the parking lot which is very gracious of the school to offer the wi-fi but they have to sit in the parking lot with their tablets or phones or chromebooks or If they have a Chromebook, I heard there was a shortage on them. So now they're trying to get them and not everybody has them. There's just shortages everywhere. I have also heard from the high school students that the book, the the Chromebooks or whatever computer that the school provides is not necessarily enough for what they need to do with it. So then a lot of kids are having to use their own computers. So then if they don't have their own computers, they're limited to whatever it is that the school computer will allow them to do. And the public education system was not set up with this ever in mind, right? That's not the the structure or the format of it. And I personally know several families who have said, okay, since this is what we're facing, we're going to actually convert to traditional homeschooling where we don't have to deal with some of these issues. But I was talking to my neighbor, I think it was last week, and she was attempting to do that. And she was on, I don't know how many wait lists. So these homeschooling and charter schools, which are usually completely open and accepting, they've got wait lists a mile long because everybody, well not everybody, but so many people are trying to make the switch and jump over. And then you're stuck there. Yeah. And you're right. The homeschool and the, dis- I think we started with homeschool, but homeschooling and distance learning are two separate things where we live. So we're saying like, Hey, distance learning parents, you're now basically a homeschool teacher. Cause it feels that way. But I've heard the same thing. What's the difference between if I continue the distance learning through my public education school, or if I move to homeschooling and then I've heard, yeah, I've heard about the endless wait lists as well. And now people are like in a panic And I, one of the reasons that I I wanted to do this episode is because what we can learn from this experience, and I I understand that not everybody wants to hear that right now, because some of y'all are like deep in the shit storm of distance learning and working from home, but there is a lot that we could teach our kids outside of academics right now through this experience. I've seen a lot of memes on Facebook that are kind of joking about the whole idea of home economics are now back in the classroom. (laughs) 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 That was a great class. That was an awesome class. Hey, like 
part of home economics. I did take home economics in, I think, both junior high and high school. That did not include cleaning other than cleaning up after when we would do the cooking. Yeah. This home economics can now include cleaning. <laughs> cleaning your room is part of your school curriculum. <laughs> We're teaching you life skills today. Kids probably love that. The other barrier that's come up is the adults whom are trying to support their kids in using this technology who are still also learning how to use the technology. And it's so hard because they, I've been hearing parents say like, I just, it's challenging. You're troubleshooting every single day of trying to fix the internet and reset the router and get them online and mute them and log in and figuring out all of these different aspects of these different platforms that are being used. Parents are feeling, not all of them, but I've been hearing some parents feeling really overwhelmed. But another struggle has been having an 11 year old try to, cause you're not sitting there watching their class or their teacher with them the whole time. And the teachers aren't necessarily telling you as the parent, there isn't an avenue, at least in our school district, there's not an avenue for them to tell you exactly what the technological format is. I mean, we know the overall, so having an 11 year old trying to explain to you what she's supposed to be doing, but it, you know, it's not right because it doesn't make any technological sense. So you're trying to figure out what exactly she's supposed to be doing. It's, you know, six o'clock at night, you can't get in touch with the teacher, understandably so. So it's like, all right, that's, that's a big tech issue we've had in this house. Teachers are absolutely facing barriers too. You've got some teachers who are fairly technological savvy that are killing it. Like I have heard really good stories about teachers who are just doing everything possible that they can in this electronic format. Then some teachers who are like, oh, do you know how difficult it is to one, manage a classroom. Now I need to manage a virtual classroom where I can see somebody disappeared and over there someone's picking their nose. And I recently heard... (laughs) That one of the students loved to sing, so you can tell that she had an AirPod or an EarPod or whatever they're called in her ear, and she was just singing her little heart out, and she was on mute during class. I mean, can you imagine being a teacher trying to guide a classroom where 30% is paying attention, 10% not there, the screens are off, and then the other ones just look like they're in another world? That is so stressful for teachers. So hands down to all the educators and administrators who are really doing their best. Yeah, and I know one of our kiddos actually has a teacher who's just embraced it and done phenomenal things with it. In fact, her kid was sharing that a lot of kids in her class that wouldn't normally participate are participating more because he's just making it so much easier for the shy kids to participate. So they're using the chat feature and really participating in discussions and that kind of thing when normally raising your hand and speaking out in a class of third kids would not be something they'd be comfortable doing. So that's been a cool thing that has happened. I've actually heard the opposite of kiddos feeling more anxious about being, because they, one, they hate being on camera. Some of them may or may not have the option of turning the camera off. So they hate being on camera and they're feeling more anxious to speak up because it's like everybody is watching and they get that intense feeling of anxiety. So for the kiddos and the teens that I've been working with, we've been managing around how to practice that speaking up and managing the anxiety enough that we could participate in the classroom. And then I've also even heard kiddos having really high anxiety with the breakout sessions. So some of these platforms allow small virtual groups. And then the intensity that comes with that is just like, <sighs> they get so overwhelmed. And a lot of things that I never anticipated. And that just speaks to the individualized nature, right? How it's going to affect everybody differently. But I know, Lisa, you wanted to really focus on things that we can teach kids during this time and lessons that can be learned. So I know you had some things on your mind. Start us off. Oh my gosh. So, so often I am redirecting parents to, look, I get it. You don't want your kid to fall behind. You don't want your kid to fail. You want them to succeed and do as well as they can right now. But dang, this entire pandemic has really created an opportunity for us as adults and caregivers to teach our children how to deal with hard stuff and how to cope with hard stuff and how to be flexible and adaptable and how those life skills are truly the skills that they need to be successful functioning adults. So those are the kinds of things that I would like parents to be focusing on versus the academic task completion. No offense to the schools. Yes, do your homework as well as you can but also teach them how to be flexible and how to adjust and how to be confident in what they can accomplish versus hyper-focusing on all the things that they can't do. How to be resilient as well. I talk to a lot of the high school students that I work with and some college students that I work with about the idea that you cannot expect the same of yourself in this distance learning environment that you do in the classroom. 
you're getting the receiving the information in significantly different ways. Digital receiving the information, your eyes are getting fatigued, you can't stand the computer as long. There's a lot of different aspects to this that you can't have the same expectations of yourself. One, grades are not, they, they don't have anything to do with who you are as a person. So that's one thing that we have to remember. But two, the grades that you're going to see now are probably not going to be the same grades that you would see in the classroom setting. Speaking of being on the computer all day, one of the college students I work with uh, recommended me some blue light glasses. And it's taken me months to get them, but apparently they're awesome. I won't tell you where I got them from, but I'm going to try them out this week. I'll let you guys know how it goes. And they look pretty cool too. Look and fly. Hey, I love some some glasses too. So I'm digging my new blue light glasses. <laughs> they are extremely helpful. So I have the only prescription I have right now is for my reading and the computer. So I have reading the reading portion and then I have the blue light for the computer. And it is makes a significant difference. I'm not in the computer as long as these kids are. However, it, it is for me a huge lifesaver. That's one of the other barriers is the fact that they're expected to be on the computer basically their entire school day. The school district people that go to those school districts. And I think they've done a great job trying to build in the schedule of take a screen break, take a screen break, take a screen break. I don't know that some kids do because I know my high school kids are like, take a screen break. Okay, text my friends. Yep. <laughs> and it's such it's such conflicting information because we try to teach healthy boundaries with your screen time, try to limit your screen time. And we're like, boom, we need you to be on the screen. 8 a.m. through 2 o'clock with these independent study breaks, and then we're back on the screen. So it's really hard to figure out the balance. But again, a really good time as a caregiver or adult to help your kids figure out what works for them and to make the best balance that they can or boundaries that they can, the setting that they have to work within their school. It's important to, as a parent, help your child understand at this point they really need to have a schedule. Whether they're in elementary school or high school, it's time for you as a parent to step in and say, okay, so this is, you have to have a nighttime routine. You have to go to bed. You can't stay up. I have some high school kids that are trying to get their schoolwork done. So they're staying up until 12, one o'clock in the morning that you cannot do. And then expect to be up at seven o'clock in the morning and be on the computer taking tests or doing whatever it is that you need to do. So we have to step in and say, okay, screen time break, not your cell phone go outside if you can unfortunately right now we're dealing with some fires in california it makes it really difficult which is also another random barrier again the rural counties i work with are the ones that are being impacted by the fires have the pg e shut off so their internet is down school scanning canceled so all these other barriers that are just popping up oh i didn't even think about the the power going out yeah, power out at rolling. So in California, if you guys live in California, you are now very aware that we've got these rolling scheduled power outages to help reduce the wildfire risk. And they are, it's just another complicating factor on top of our, our households. It makes complete sense that they do that because we don't want any more fires. We've already had, I think, millions of acres burned. It's really sad. So this is when you have to be flexible. So many kids in our society face horrendous life circumstances day in and day out, but there are also a large percentage of our kids that have not faced significant adversity in terms of societal level. So this, I mean, they're getting hit with it all at once, but at the same time, we as parents, as caregivers, as whatever our role as an adult is in this child's life have the opportunity right now to have an impact on which direction this goes. This is either going to be mass trauma for these kids, or we're going to teach them resiliency or a combination of both. But, you know, I read something the other day thinking about somebody who was born in the 1900s and everything they endured, all the different wars, the flu, the Great Depression. I mean, just one major mass trauma after another. And I mean, my great grandparents would have been in that in that age bracket. And I can, I just remember sitting at their feet, listening to stories growing up as a kid that were so inspiring. And we have the opportunity right now to teach our kids that it's about more than just 
for example, this article I read was, you know, that my Amazon package is going to be two days delayed. It's the world is much bigger than your Amazon package. The world is much bigger than your little tiny circle right now. So in how we handle it and steer them through this is we're teaching them major life lessons that will help them be able to rebound and manage more complicated situations as they get older. And I would challenge the parents and listeners to reflect on what your values are and what life lessons you truly want to teach your children and figure out how you're going to do that. Because like we said, this is a huge opportunity for you to teach kindness and empathy and flexibility and acceptance around some of the things that we cannot change or gaining more control over the things that we can. And what do you want to do about it? How do you speak up? How do you advocate for yourself? teach them, uh, model these effective communication skills that are going to help them figure out what they're feeling and then tell you about how, what they're feeling. Yeah. If we run around, like this is the end of the world, this is the end all be all. That's how the kids are going to respond. It doesn't matter. You talk to them specifically. You have to remember they're watching you 24 seven. Basically you have to respond to everything in the appropriate way so that they can learn how to respond in the appropriate way. This isn't the end of the world. Does it suck? Probably. Are you sure? Because there's people (laughs) saying it is. And we got fires, we got plague, or not plague. (laughs) We actually have a a confirmed case of the plague. (laughs) No, we do have a bad. (laughs) Wrong word. I meant pandemic. Plagues are here. There is... No, seriously, there is a confirmed case of the plague in California. <laughs> oh my gosh. We have a killer bee. There we go. Here. So, but this is, that is a common thing in the summertime, apparently. It's just not that common in California in the area that it was. So that's not necessarily a big deal. No, this isn't the end of the world. It I feel like, like you it. just jinxed us on the <laughs> podcast. You just announced that the plague being in California is not a big deal, which it may not be, but you just like said it factually on a, a podcast. And so now, <laughs> now it's going to be a big deal. Honestly, with these wildfires, I feel like I'm in the middle of that Silent Hill movie. If anybody has ever watched that Silent Hill movie and that like old school alarm goes off and everything turns into, ugh. anyways, that's where I feel like I'm at this morning. <laughs> okay. So think about, I mean, we all just have like our little moment and to tie, it, <laughs> to tie it back to what Jolene was talking about actions speak louder than words. So if you sit down and you tell your kid, everything's going to be fine. Da, 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 and then you get up and you just spin out of control and they watch you in your day-to-day life. I mean, what you sit down and reassure them is not, is not going to sink in. It's not going to matter because they recognize that you're not behaving like that. So everybody needs their, their moments, but how do you have those moments in what capacity do you have them how do you do you do them or do you have them in front of your children? And if you do, how do you talk about them? Yeah. How do you recover after you have a serious meltdown in front of your kids? Cause that's going to happen sometimes, but I'm also going to ask you to practice that self-awareness that we talk about. If you are feeling like you're doing your best and it is just, you can barely keep your head above water, like figure out how to access the resources around you, how to ask for help. If you're somebody who typically has somebody as a Uh, that has a hard time asking, figure out how to get past that personal barrier and use the resources that you have. If you have other stuff that's coming up for you, it is your responsibility as the adult to deal with that stuff. So you can be the best parent, caregiver, distance learning teacher that you can. And not everybody is going to require counseling or therapy to navigate situations like this. Some people have their coping skills established, such a strong support system at home, familially, within friend groups, uh, where they're not going to need that level of care. But many people out there may need some counseling and therapy during this time, too. So as three therapists who are making mental health more relatable, just keep that on the back burner in your mind where hey, you know what, if I just recognize or I start to notice with that self-awareness that I'm not okay and it's affecting my functioning, it's affecting my kids, might be time to make some calls and, and look into getting some counseling. So, and as a reminder, we all are therapists and actually all three of us do deal with anxiety in our practices. So let's take a minute, remind everybody where we are, but I am Nikki, co-owner of Catalyst Counseling Incorporated in Modesto, California. And we actually do have our Stacey Anderson Young co-owner who does phenomenal work with anxiety. Uh, So that is a resource. Jolene? 
I am Jolene from Jolene Daily LMFT. I am my own business, private practice. <laughs> I am also located here in Modesto, California. I love that. I am Jolene of Jolene Daily. <laughs> <laughs> so proud. And you can find information about our services. We specialize in trauma and anxiety at smalltowncounselingca.com. So I want to go back to how do you, Alyssa's statement of how do you recover? I want to add a little bit to that is when, when you're a parent and you have little ones or even adolescents who are watching you and learning because we are in fact social learners as human beings and you mess up and you're like, have this moment where you have a freak out and you're running around the house, like your hair's caught on fire. And then you catch your breath and you're like, okay, I am overreacting. Just acknowledge it. Like, hey, I am overreacting. This is not the appropriate way to respond. (laughs) I could have done this or there's a better way to do this. People around right now are talking about anger and the fact that anger is not an inappropriate emotion. Absolutely. It's the behaviors that go along with it that are the problem. So no emotion is an inappropriate emotion. It's how you behave when you experience those emotions. And then you just acknowledge it and explain it. And then maybe take a few moments and put on a YouTube meditation or breathing app and calm. Everybody does the breathing app. Calm down. Ooh, that's a really good idea. So for a part of this distance learning, one thing that I could recommend for families out there is in the same way that you have a schedule for your academic day, drop in a breathing exercise or a mindfulness activity. You could Pinterest it, you could YouTube it, you could Google it. You could find this stuff everywhere. You could probably find some resources on our websites, but Find a way to casually, routinely drop in some mindfulness transition activities. Maybe it's, okay, we've wrapped up our first uh, portion of our academic day. Let's do this mindfulness activity before we transition to your independent study. Or during lunch, do some mindful eating uh, practices or activities. So you can teach them throughout their academic learning day too. My recommendation for parents of elementary school kids it was, there's three phases that you kind of add into their school day. And so the first phase is positive affirmations in the mirror. And so you picking kind of some positive things that you know about the kid or that you know about the family and you say, repeat those positive affirmations in the mirror. And then one of the screen breaks, you go and do some kind of deep breathing activity. There's a lot of different options that you can find online to do some deep breathing activities with the kids. And then at the end of the day, you get a dance party. And so some kind of kids song that you want to dance to and have a party with everybody and just have a dance party and kind of shake everything off for the end of the day. I love it. I got to say dance parties are big at our house and not because I enjoy them to watch what the effect it has on my family. They love them. And it's so incredibly it's stress inducing for me because I can't dance for anything for them. It is the most stress relieving activity. And it's so cool because I usually I'll participate, but I also like to to watch and I participate in other ways, you know, a little lip sync and such, but to just sit there for a pause and watch them all dance it out, they call it. And it's crazy to watch. You can just visibly watch the stress level decrease. That's a great way to end that academic day. I like that. Well, you've heard it from us. We talked about a little bit about the barriers to distance learning, at least that we've encountered in the California area. If you are listening outside of California or outside of the United States, let us know how you guys are managing distance learning. And you've also heard some tips on how to support the emotional well-being of your child through this entire pandemic and transition and adjustment to distance learning. Thank you for joining us and allowing us into your ears today. We hope to see you on the next episode of Therapist Uncut. You guys take care. Have a good one. Thank you for joining Therapist Uncut, a production of AMP Smart Business. To learn more about Therapist Uncut and stay up on upcoming episodes, please subscribe and follow us on social media. As a reminder, although the Therapist Uncut co-hosts are licensed therapists, they are not your therapists. This podcast is not intended to substitute professional mental health counseling. If you need professional therapy, please contact your local provider or primary care provider. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you on the next episode of Therapist Uncut.